Hello, everyone. Greetings and welcome to today's Venezuela Solidarity Network webinar and monthly online picket. It is my pleasure to welcome you here today. Before we go any further, uh, up on the screen, you will see instructions for how to join the interpretation system. Uh, if you know how to do that already, you can see that it is active. Uh, to join, you can participate in either English or Spanish, and you can uh, see the options for how to join down at the bottom. As you can see on the screen, uh, you are looking for the globe symbol or the flag symbol, uh, either on your phone under the three dots or in the screen. We'll leave that there a minute while we get set up. Uh, the chat is open if you'd like to post in the chat where you're joining us from here today. All right, thank you everyone. If you have additional questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat regarding translation. Welcome again to the Venezuela Solidarity Network's monthly webinar and online picket, uh, talking about our role as people in North America to fight against US-Canada sanctions on Venezuela and intervention in Venezuela by learning and exchanging with Venezuelan voices alongside voices from people here in the United States, Canada, and beyond. This month's action is hosted by a member group of the Venezuela Solidarity Network, the Alliance for Global Justice. Thank you to the Alliance for Global Justice for hosting your support for this action and uh, for our work together in the Venezuela Solidarity Network. My name is Allison Bodine. I am the coordinator of Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, and author of the book, Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Venezuela from Battle of Ideas Press. First, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking from Vancouver, Canada, the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. As we defend Venezuela's right to self-determination, we also stand with indigenous nations and defend their right to self-determination. Today is the second monthly of the Venezuela Solidarity Network's monthly webinar and online picket actions. For over three years, for 38 consecutive months, the monthly Venezuela picket actions for US Canada hands off Venezuela have been organized by Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, the Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg, and Just Peace Advocates here in Canada. But now the online picket actions and monthly webinars are being organized by the Venezuela Solidarity Network, a new North America-based network of organizations and individuals working to defend Venezuela's sovereignty and self-determination against US government-led sanctions and attacks. Sponsoring organizations of the Venezuela Solidarity Network include the Alberto Lovera Bolivarian Circle in New York City, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, GC, the Alliance for Global Justice, Chicago Alba Solidarity, Code Pink, Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice Canada, the International Action Center, the Louis Riel Bolivarian Circle of Toronto, the Orinoco Tribune, Task Force on the Americas, Venezuela Analysis, and Workers World Party. We encourage you, anyone who's listening to us here today, to also join in. And in the chat in a minute, we'll put a link where you can get more information about the Venezuela Solidarity Network, including our basis of unity, and fill out a form for how to join. Today, we have with us Venezuela's Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs for North America, Carlos Ron, and Yosmer Ali Arellan, academic collaborator of the UN Special Rapporteur on the impact of unilateral coercive measures, Elena Dohan, for an important discussion 
discussion on Venezuela's resistance to U.S. hybrid warfare, especially at this time leading up to the Venezuelan presidential election on July 28th of this year. Today, we will hear how the Venezuelan people and government have achieved remarkable economic progress and diplomatic success while they fight this cruel and criminal blockade and sanctions imposed by the United States, but also supported by countries such as Canada and the European Union. Since affirming its right to self-determination, Venezuela's Bolivarian Revolution has been the target of U.S. imperial power and persistent regime change attempts. As Venezuela prepares for its July 28th presidential elections, it continues to confront hybrid warfare aimed at overturning the popular will and undermining its democracy. Coup attempts, assassination plots, and economic strangulation under the U.S. blockade. Today, we'll hear direct from people organizing in Venezuela, important voices in this fight back against the U.S. blockade. I also look forward to hearing from William Kamakaro with the Alliance for Global Justice, who will give us a report from an action that took place yesterday at the United States mission to the United Nations in New York City, where they brought a petition uh, condemning the attacks against President Maduro's life and assassination attempts. Without further ado, um, I'll just explain very briefly the program. Uh, we're gonna have our two Venezuelan speakers, then hear a report from William Kamakaro, then there'll be some announcements where we can prepare our questions. There's time for a Q&A, some reminders, and then as usual, as been the tradition of these online picket actions, uh, we will have time and opportunity for a group photo. Again, I appreciate folks joining us this afternoon from wherever you're joining. If you're just joining and listening to me now, reminder that there is translation available and I will go ahead and introduce our first speaker. The first speaker today is Yosmer Arayan. He is an academic collaborator of the UN Special Rapporteur on the impact of unilateral coercive measures Alina Dohan. Yosmer has 25 years of experience in responsibilities and advice on economics and finances for Venezuela. He's a specialist in policy design and the execution of programs regarding credit, budget, strategic planning. He's specialized in financial ma risk management, project evaluation, development of mathematical and statistical risk estimation models, and more. He is the research team coordinator for the study of the impact of unilateral coercive measures, another word for blockade and sanctions, on the Venezuelan economy. And with that bio, we can definitely understand why his voice is so important as we work to understand the impact of U.S. policy in Venezuela and arm ourselves to combat it. Yosmer, thank you so much for making time to join us here today. The floor is yours. All right, good evening and thank you very much. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here at this webinar and I'd like to thank the Alliance for Global Justice and everyone who is here in this webinar and particularly my friend and brother Carlos Ron, the uh, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. I think I have 15 minutes and I'll try to make good use of this. The problem is I've done five years of research and I'm only going to be able to show you a little bit of this and a few other things from here um, all of which goes into the knowledge that we have about the impact of unilateral coercive measures. There is a much jurisprudence in this in the world. The United States is applying this method because they know that is uh, not contemplated within international public law. In order to punish this, well, it's kind of strange because these are like bombs 
that they drop on countries, they ha have the same effects, migration, social d breakdown, they completely disrupt the economic cycle, they provoke hunger and poverty, but they're not material bombs. So these are more distorted measures of distortion. And I want to tell you, uh, based on this experience, uh, five years of studying this, I, I hope you can hear me well, this experience uh, has provoked a lot of rage because it is such a tremendous injustice. It's an economic genocide that uh, has impacts on the well-being of all of our society and everything that we've achieved since 1999. And it has caused setbacks because of the bombs of UCMs being dropped on our society. And people, it provokes rage and pain. So what I want to tell you, these uh, coerc coercive measures for example, they have had a significant impact on rising infant mortality rates. What can that provoke but pain, that information? And so the idea of this webinar is also to say, what are we doing to escape this siege? It's a multifrontal attack. And af what happens after this stage? We've withstood the storm, but now with dignity and bravery, we have withstood it and we're recovering, but on our own, uh, of our own will. Nobody has helped us. Many countries who are allies and who enjoyed the benefits of being friends of Venezuela during our petroleum heyday, well, I have to say, in all honesty, that they weren't really with us. So just to get down to brass tacks, I'm going to provide some context because we can't talk about the recovery. Everything's getting much better. And we have our economy growing. We have the lowest uh, levels of inflation for uh, 12 to 15 years and a stable exchange rate. In other words, the uh, Exchange rate with the dollar before was a big problem, but we're overcoming this. But there is a tremendous lack of knowledge about what all of this has caused. Even in Venezuela, about four years ago, we started doing research to explain why people do not understand the impact of unilateral coercive measures and why they blame the government for it. I'm not trying to say that the government has no responsible in, the, in this because there has been some inefficiency and corruption that is there. But those traditional ills of any country is nothing compared to what the United States intentionally imposed on Venezuela. So it is not right to attribute it that way. It is clear that it's more than 900 coercive coercive measures under threats, uh, uh, distortions and blockade. It is important to know that this is a complete decade of this. And there are also people who have confessed many Venezuelans are not available to this and many people abroad that speak for themselves. For example, when Joseph Durrell comes in and says that sanctions are like arsenic, it's poison that slowly but surely kills people when and I'm going to read some of their words, and excuse me for reading this. Uh, Woodrow Wilson said, a nation that is under boycott is ready to give up. And we apply this medicine, I don't know why he calls it medicine when it's really poison, this peaceful economic medicine. He says it's a peaceful economic measure because they're not launch, uh, dropping bombs on us, which is a silent killer. And we don't need to deploy uh, forces, projectiles, and and outside of the boycotted nation. But it does exert pressure within the country, which in my view, no modern uh, nation could withstand this. He said that and he thought nobody could withstand this and we have withstood it. We're going to continue to withstand it. And the strength of the people is not explained as easily as someone like uh, Woodrow Wilson might say, as our uh, host, Allison said, Venezuela is and the vanguard of breaking down worldwide capitalism and 
Now, uh, it seems that it's become irreversible. When we say irreversible, that means because it's been boycotted and stopped by the United States. But you could say with all certainty in doing everything possible to do what they did, and they tried to assassinate Comandante Chavez, that's the first thing. But after that, they knew that the model was very successful and they had to stop it somehow. And so they applied the UCMs just a, starting a year after President Chavez died. We have the largest oil reserves in the world. And after 2014, the biggest servicing of the debt that was concluded, we were able to pay off the debt to service his debt with the oil revenue that we had through 2013. And after that, there was a big drop between 2014 and 16, a 60% drop in oil prices that also complicated the situation. There are analysts and political economists who say that uh, uh, that Venezuela wasn't doing right. No, we were, we're not saying that in 2013, the GDP of Venezuela was more than $200 billion. That's approximately four times bigger than what it was during the previous 30 years. In other words, it is an economy that was really overheating, in fact, because we had uh, several uh, quarters of continuous growth. And we had, it was slowing down. It slowed down 2013 to 2014 and then went up to 280 billion to 210 billion. But up till then, 210 billion is pretty high for Venezuela. There was more accustomed to 60 to 80 billion GDP. So it is false to say that we did not put together a good project and that we prevented the economy from reaching a higher level. We started uh, starting with some 200 billion. This was not an economy that was bad shape. It was in bad shape when it was around 50 billion. This is to help you understand the context. It's not that we were doing things wrong or that PDVSA was not doing well. That's another lie that needs to be refuted. And so the PDVSA, the oil company, we have repeatedly said, and even people in Venezuela unfortunately believe this, that PDVSA was destroyed. In fact, if that were true, and then I would uh, ask uh, something to the people who say that, then explain to me as if I were a two-year-old or four-year-old child, why is it possible then for to get down to uh, 340,000 barrels a day? How is it possible to now we... We're at almost a million barrels. If we destroyed PDVSA and it doesn't, it's ruin, and because we're uh, corrupt, inefficient, and dumb, whatever you want to accuse us of, then how is it possible for 600,000 barrels to be coming out now? What's Chevron doing here? If PDVSA, if we destroyed it because we're so inefficient and corrupt, then why has Chevron come back here a couple of years ago, uh, uh, getting a license from the United States to extract petroleum, and they've been uh, contributing more than $200 billion. So all of these lies fall on their face. The Bolivarian Revolution that started in 1999 obviously generated economic indicators and indicators of social well-being and social justice that had to be stopped by the US because this was going to be an example for the world. It already is, but it was going to be an even bigger example and become irreversible. That's one thing. And the other thing is that as Walton says, uh, Bolton said in his uh, book, uh, Venezuela is still our backyard. And so those uh, 600,000 barrels of oil are mine. And that I'm gonna blockade it. That is how people die. They don't care what's happening in Palestine. They don't apply UCMs against Israel. It's a, a nefarious hypocrisy, and they are the evil of the planet. So that's the first thing that I wanted to talk about is these unilateral coercive measures or UCMs. And then I don't know how much time I have. I didn't, it, it, you have to give me a reminder when my time is almost up. But I also, as somebody's asking what UCMs are, unilateral coercive measures. And I have a premise for you. I just concluded a book that's going to come out in a couple of weeks 
a book that I wrote with an entire team, but it includes the participation of Jorge Terias and Montserrat and Rosales, um, who is the, he's the secretary of ALBA. Uh, it's still getting corrected. I've got the draft here. And it's also part of this book that I've got here. It includes a lot of definitions of unilateral coercive measures. And they also could be called extortion. And it's not formally set forth in any book, but uh, uh, this is being tested because they are multidimensional. They take many forms and you have to look at the causal nexus between the measure and the impacts. This is not always completely clear in some cases. Sometimes the U.S. prevents um, your neighbors from getting engaging in negotiations with Venezuela. And so we have all of our financial systems shut down and we can't even buy vaccines. And so that is the U.S. is threatening all all our trading partners, and they say, you can't even sell them a liter of water. So how does this work? This is called overcompliance. And there is a zero risk policy and overcompliance, which has exacerbated and expanded the impacts of the unilateral course of measures. So I would like to go into part of the book, which is what they did to us. I'm just gonna give you an example because unfortunately I don't have enough time to explain it with scientific academic uh, language, everything that we put forth in the book. But I would like to talk about how how I explain it in communities in Venezuela. They have a question, they always ask me, isn't it really because of corruption and government inefficiency, more that than sanctions uh, responsible for economic problems in Venezuela? Who is more to blame? And so, excuse me, just a second. Sorry, I had to resolve a technical issue. I'm just going to give you an example. And it is very important to be able to understand the impact of unilateral coercive measures. Imagine that, let's going to say we have a lady in Venezuela. Her name Simona. Simona is someone who has three health issues, diabetes, hypertens oh, hyper oh, she has high cholesterol, and... She has something else, hypertension, okay? She's 60 years old, and she takes pills for all of this. She still eats a lot of junk food, and she didn't stop eating carbs, and so she is sick. And then what I want to say with this is Simone is in Venezuela, and she has these diseases as a result of her own development over the course of her life. What can we cure? Corruption, inefficiency, indolence, and lack of organization of many things. That's one thing, but the uh, rentierism from oil, it seems like we all have like a matrix, uh, like from the matrix, we have the rent that feeds us. We have to get rid of that and begin to do what we've been doing over the last three years, which is to produce our own what we need. But uh, Simona has those three diseases and she goes out into the street and she sees a, a ne'er-do-well there who wants to uh, rob her and shoots her in the head. And then she goes into the ice. See you. So I'd like to ask all of you, how do you answer this? This is a rhetorical question. She's in, is she in the ICU because of getting shot in the head or because she suffers um, high lipids, diabetes, and hypertension? No, she went into the ICU because she got shot in the head. The bullet in the head is the sanctions. The high cholesterol, diabetes, and hypertension are the problems that we have to address. But the bullet in the head that was shot at our at society and our, econ our economy, which is unjust and illegitimately imposed by the United States, 
caused us to go into the ICU. So there is no debate about whether it's the sanctions are more or less to blame. Obviously, if you have diabetes and hypertension, that's bad. And that makes the patient in worse shape. But the patient, Simona, had to go into the ICU because she got a bullet in the head. And so that's how I try to help people understand the impact of the UCMs. It's not because of our endogenous problems. There is corruption and indolence and all of these things. It's true in all the governments around the world. And even for oil production, it has not fallen by 80%. Coincidentally, after the UCMs, the production dropped. But oil revenues and uh, hard currency uh, uh, revenues fell by 90%. So in Venezuela, how did they do this? They attacked our main source of income, which is oil and, and obviously if there is a causal nexus and the channel of the transmission is very easy to determine because we are so dependent on oil. If you cut off, turn off the spigot or do things so the spigot gets cut off, then obviously it's going to affect the entire economy and the entire country. Also, if you bl blockade the international financial system, the, let's say they're going to put the, the little amount of money that I have uh, because you cut off the oil, I'm going to use what little money I have to buy vaccine, vaccines and other medicines. But if we don't have this, we don't have access to finance. How can I pay for these products? And then also I can uh, request financing. They cut off all sources of financing for me to be able to uh, make up for the lost production here and the drop in prices. And all countries incur debt in order to address urgent needs. But even the International Monetary Fund, in the middle of the pandemic, if you can imagine it, would give us the money that they gave to many sanctioned countries for us to face the pandemic. So this is really a crime against humanity because, in fact, and they're idiots, excuse me for saying so, if you don't give a country the resources to confront the pandemic, it's going to continue to spread. And But our president managed it very well, and we managed to overcome it. And now we get on to the next point. Uh, and I'll try to be a little bit quicker. I see I have a board here. I'm not going to show it to you, but I, I, I'm looking up at my board, which wrote where I wrote down the points I don't want to forget, even under blockade and with the UCMs in full uh, flower, how could we confront it? What did Venezuela do to overcome the blockade? Well, I've divided it into three major moments. The first one follows the timeline of the last 10 years, which is resistant ours as a heroic people that have been able to overcome these and this was a tremendous drop. People didn't have money to buy anything. More than 335,000% inflation in just one year. And a variation in the exchange rate of uh, 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 tremendous levels. These are unimaginable figures that have caused our purchasing power to plummet. And I might have money to pay for um maintenance, all of this uh, causes the effect to expand throughout the country, the electricity system, the water system, everything fell into disrepair. And the period of resistance included uh, distortions. I'm sorry. Uh, that came about in the midst of all these problems. For example, there's something called Bachakeo. I don't know how, how you say that in English, but it's the illegal sale of uh, the prime necessities and people got in a line to buy one little loaf of bread or, or a roll. They were in line for two to three hours. Uh, if somebody's, there was something called dollar today over the internet. There was a disaster. All of this was caused by the coercive measures and the drop in revenue. What did we do? It came to the point where we had to take drastic measures, which in fact were criticized by the Venezuelan 
left, uh, that's what we call them, we look at the behavior of some agents who are criticized whatever we do. That is really impressive. We have our enemy there who did all of this to cause people to suffer, to have their salaries lose value and to suffer in multiple form. And so what people are going to do is attack the government. Why don't you attack the United States? They're the ones who impose the measures. The fact is that this was a tremendous period of resistance and of dignity of the Venezuelan people, which must always be recognized because the United States did everything that they did to spread discontent and get people to come out in the streets to try to bring down the legitimately elected constitutional president, Nicolas Maduro. But this did not happen. Rather, we began to transform the situation. We stopped consuming butter. Since we were such a wealthy country, we imported butter. We used, it, it was like a bacchanal. We were uh, consuming all kinds of imported liquor. We began to be more careful to find other jobs and not to uh, depend on oil revenue. We took away that little crutch, that that tube that we, was in our necks. And then the government realized it had to be more austere, more um, and take bold measures. And these bold measures led us miraculously, and I even say this in my book, and, and Carlos Ron is familiar with this theory that I have. And I think that a virtuous formula was applied, a virtuous formula, that is, that we applied a series of measures that we really should share with the world. I write about them. We should make this available so that everybody can know what we did, what were the various medicines that we applied to reverse the effect. Now, careful within the framework of still a very low level of revenue. But what little could we do, as the president himself said, to do a lot with very little or to do something with nothing? We began to be more efficient. We learned that you don't waste water. We learned that you don't waste electricity. And we learned that we had to have two or three jobs to have revenue, we have to produce things at home, we have to grow our own food. And so all kinds of wonderful things occurred to us. For example, previously, there were two or three brands of corn flour. Uh, repas are a very important part of the Venezuelan diet, but more than 20 appeared then. And, and this was uh, mostly imported. Now, almost 100% of our food is produced here. Another miraculous effect was created was um, entrepreneurship. People started business at home selling uh, frozen treats to have uh, micro and medium-sized enterprises and to not depend on imports. In addition, this virtuous fo formula came to the second major moment. First was resistance. The second, and was even more important than the last one, which is recovery, is to achieve stability. If we were not able to stabilize, then the exchange rate with the dollar and inflation, then none of the economic agents, no human being is going to invest, is going to launch a business if you have 330,000% inflation, 70-some uh, uh, percent exchange rate. What positive expectations could investor have? Once we managed to take these measures and found the virtuous formula, and this virtuous formula must be recognized, and I have to say that here, that it was the result at the end of the day, the one who decided on the virtuous formula was President Nicolas Maduro. Here, no matter how much uh, that I may be recognized as the director of the uh, at the Central Bank of Venezuela, and today I'm not speaking as part of the board of directors of the Central Bank, but rather as an economic researcher, I must acknowledge that the president 
was the one who changed the path and turned the wheel and began to apply measures that caused inflation and the dollar exchange rate to stabilize. Once that happened, then we went into a period of stability, talking about two plus years ago, and now we have inflation markers uh, that are incredible. We don't have exchange controls, but we have control over the dollar. We don't have price controls, but prices are stable. So inflation is 1.2%, unheard of in Venezuela for at least the last 20 years, because all of these virtuous formulas are have put a new uh, mindset in the Venezuelan people to not depend on oil revenue. And you have to stop thinking that I don't need to use that anymore. Have I don't want to do that. That's irresponsible. Now look what's happening. Now I have the oil revenue here in my pocket. And now with the struggle over prices is a little bit more equitable. It's it's there's a situation of greater parity and prices stabilize to close out. Then the next major moment came first. We had resistance, which has remained over time, and then stability that sounded in 2019 that I can't tell you about here. There are several of them, and it would take too long of a technical explanation to uh, uh, explain it. But then we came to the third major moment after resistance, uh, changing our behavior, and then we took measures to stabilize the most important nominal values of the economy, and something appears which was sensible, and that was recovery. In other words, first we started, we had the big fall, and then we began to go back up again. I'm not trying to say that uh, we can uh, have a victory yet. We've had 12 um, uh, quarters of growth thanks to our people, our president, and our formula, and we learned to do things better. Our people are rebuilding. We are relearning. We are leaving behind uh, things that need to be eliminated, uh, the parasites. And I think that we have all of these periods. I saw this very up, uh, very much up close because I was at the central bank and I also go out in the street and I conduct surveys. I see how we are being reborn. It is really extraordinary. That's what I was saying at the beginning. And I'd like to conclude with something something very bad was done to us that we do not deserve just because we wanted self-determination and because we were had our economy growing over uh, dozens of of quarters then that's why they have to sanction us and they do not have the authority to impose sanctions on us. Only the UN does that. And in fact, the UN has lost some of its legitimacy. So if we look at this, and now in this new process of the last two to three years, we have managed this with dignity and bravery. With great dignity, we resisted. And with great dignity, we are moving forward. And we've also been brave because we're going to uh, we withstood all of this, and we're going to continue to move forward with the recovery. This is very nice, and I can tell you that we feel that there is some inequality as a result of the UCMs, but we have this gap here is moving upwards. It's not the same to have the same gap, which in itself is bad, and this uh, gap this. Uh, gap in uh, income levels. No, people, no, here the teachers earn $3, but you have to look at the overall income that people have in Venezuela. I myself and our measurement is around $200, $230, which is a tremendous increase. And this is a result. And be careful. One thing I wanted to say, you the private entrepreneurs also change their logic. That's very important because previously during the Chavez period, the private enterprise also had like a trachea tube here on the back and they just wanted to rely on oil revenue and they were very hostile to President Chavez and would not cooperate on any solutions. So it was a bourgeois uh, entrepreneurial class that was 
uh, food mongering. But over time, they also were punished by this and they were left without any money because the blockade and the coercive, the coercive measures put an end to everything. So then they also reacted. They got rid of that dependency on oil revenue and worked with their own pockets. If they had done this before with the level of a boom that we had, and you can listen to what I'm going to say now, during the Chavez years, there's an indicator called international investment position. And that's the liquidity that all Venezuelans have in uh, bank accounts uh, overseas. This indicator would be around $250 billion. Now, just imagine that. That is really a huge figure. So they were extracting revenue from Venezuela, not investing it in the country. That is very unfortunate because this is a business class that is not nationalist. But now I could say that they are believing in the country and this is bearing fruits. And the figures, uh, I, uh, I was going to show you some figures, but we don't have time. But in Venezuela, uh, the loss in uh, oil production, according to the latest uh, calculations, about $228 billion. In other words, oil no longer gave $228 billion. And now this gets to go into the economy and it expands. It has a positive, expanding positive in capital. And now when we look at this impact on GDP with the production of goods and services throughout the entire country, and we see that uh, between 2015, I, I, I don't know, uh, between 2015 and 2023, economic losses to GDP was giving us an impressive figure, Tri a trillion dollars. So a trillion dollars to make that clear. That is what the Venezuelan economy failed to have in revenue between 2015 and 2023. That is the level of the damage imposed on our economy and our people because of the illegitimate and inhumane application of unilateral coercive measures, which are crimes against humanity. I have far more to share with you, but I think my time is up. And I think, in fact, I'm abusing uh, your time. Thank you very much. And I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you, Yosef. Uh, really, it's no abuse. We are very grateful for your wealth of knowledge and experience. This is the information that we need in order to combat these unilateral coercive measures, the U.S. blockade and sanctions that are strangling the economy of Venezuela. But as we've talked about, Venezuela is overcoming that. So interesting to hear your analysis about the diversification of the economy, how Venezuela deals with dependence on oil, um, kind of uh, just really, uh, yeah, it was a marathon and of information and we're really grateful for, for that. Um, don't worry all, the presentation is recorded. We'll send it out so you can listen to it again. Um, but I already also do see folks posting in the Q&A. If you have questions, in English or Spanish, feel free to post them in the question and answer box and we'll have time. Uh, Carlos Ron uh, generously offered partly through uh, Yosmer's talk to lend some of his time to Yosmer with that important information. So don't worry all, we are right on schedule. Um, so next I want to invite uh, Carlos Ron. Carlos Ron is Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs for North America at the Venezuelan Ministry of External Affairs and president of the Simone Bolivar Institute for Peace and Solidarity Among Peoples. As a diplomat, he was Venezuela's Charge de Affairs to the United States of America from 2017 to 2018. And he's also represented Venezuela in other capacities in the US between 2014 and 2018 and in Brazil from 2010 to 2014. So. Uh, Carlos, welcome today for some responses and additions to really the, the wealth of knowledge that we got from Yosmer.
undertaken against Venezuela is really an attack against any of Latin Americans' uh, democracy. We saw it here in Honduras when there was a, a, a strong advance at, at uh, reshaping the constitution. I mean, and and and, and you know, that, that was the the purpose of the uh, of this in, in the Salaya government that that later got attacked and overthrown. Uh, and and we see that this this reaction, uh, you know, that, that has been going on for um, more than fifteen years now, against all these progressive and and left wing and revolutionary advances in Latin America, is part of this big design of how to create pain and suffering in the people of Latin America, so that they would turn against those governments that are providing. A new alternative that are providing something different from what the the imperialist recipe is for a reason. I really, I'm really glad that we're doing this uh, this uh, webinar, and I'm really glad that our friend uh, Josman was able to present. I know he has a lot, of course, to uh, to tell us a lot more to tell us um, because I think he has done a terrific job, and, and you know, proud to. To have him as a friend and, and to see somebody that has uh, dedicated his uh, his work precisely to for this uh, recuperation of um, the Venezuelan economy, because you see one of the things that one of the things I think that we have to to Everything that had been positive, everything you know that had been achieved during the Chavez years, you know, strong education and strong uh, uh, in indicators of uh, nutrition, a strong um, uh, housing, uh, you know, every everything that had been successful and that and that had gave us hope in in the socialism of the twenty first century. That was exactly what was attacked, and that was exactly what. what with, with you know, trying to attack both the the gains of socialism, but at the same time trying to blame socialism for that disruption, and this this is a you know this is this is really a, the the way you see how um, the the information uh, is manipulated so that people start blaming uh, socialism for actually the the you know the attacks that. Uh, predatory capitalism through sanctions is uh, taking place. You know, uh, we, we've been reflecting in the last uh, couple of of, uh, of weeks about the you know the um, the election context in the U.S. You know, all know we have elections on the twenty eighth of July, and you know one of the reasons that that we believe uh, uh, our people are going to. Uh, clearly remain and, and re-elect the, the Bolivarian Revolution is precisely because we are, you know, we, we have been able to achieve in these 25 years a lot of important gains. And I'm just going to give you, you know, uh, a, a number I stumbled upon the other day, which I thought was interesting for this, uh, with regards to nutrition, for example. Um, before 1998, or, or I should say, at 1998, the year that President Chavez comes into office, the the mal the, the undernutrition levels of uh, of Venezuela was at 16.4 percent, which was pretty high. And and these are the people you know that, that was previous to the revolution. During the revolution, in the year 2011, for example, we 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 made that number that level of uh, undernourished people decreased so so much that it went down to 3.1% in two, in 2011 but I'll tell you something even more interesting at, at when the blockade i mean the maximum pressure campaign uh began already you know the, there were sanctions already in place but when the maximum pressure campaign began in 2017 that that rate went up to 13% that's still below the rate before the revolution, before Chavez came into power. So, just, that's just to say, the achievements of the revolution were so were so strong and so powerful, and something like fighting hunger, that even with the blockade, we still had better numbers than 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 you know the previous uh, um, administrations before President Chavez. And those people, 
that were involved in 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 that high under the under nourishment uh, um, rates previous to the Bolivarian Revolution are exactly the same people that are trying to convince the Venezuelan voters now that they are going to improve the economy and they are going to do better things uh, for the Venezuelan people than the revolution has. Yeah, I think I think the story of the Venezuelan Revolution, the, yeah, especially under the under the presidency of, of, of President Maduro, has been as a story of resilience, but both of the leadership as well as organized uh, people. Because I think we cannot understand. This is something I like to stress a lot. We cannot understand the extraordinary um, story of the Venezuelan people if we don't understand that what we have taken place right now is a combination of uh, uh, a leadership, a strong leadership in the state, which is actually a collective leadership out of the people that worked with President Chavez, from President Maduro to the rest of his uh, team. This is a collective leadership with the political will to transform society together with organized people's power willing to be part and to execute that transformation. If we did not have both these two elements, the leadership and the organization, there cannot be any of the transformations, nor, the, nor could they be any of the resistance that we have uh, uh, faced uh, so far. The, 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 you know, one of the things that, that Josmer always points out when, when we had these conversations, and I think it's also important to, to stress here, is that the perversity of the sanctions is that is, it is in, in, a, in a system like Venezuela, is that it's also the same to punish the state, to punish the government by cutting off any income from the state. This is what makes it impossible for us to raise salaries in, in a way that would not affect inflation or would not affect the economy or that would, or even, I mean, we don't even have enough money to give, you know, to maintain the standards that we had prior to the, uh, to the dram dramatic loss of, of income. So, so you have, so you have two things there. Uh, you know, you have, uh, you have the um, uh, the loss of you know the problem with with the, with the loss of the high loss of income as well as uh, you know the, the, the perversity of, of 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 using that to to cut off the state as well as the the intention to uh, um, support um, the private sector in a way that you can say. Well, look, it's the government that doesn't work. It's socialism that doesn't work. But look how the private sector actually works. So you, you, you it's it's a perverse system where you're actually trying to convince people that uh, because the private sector does have some leeway and does have some capacity to grow under the sanctions regime, that that is the solution and not the state that was actually implementing measures to you know guarantee uh, uh, the 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 diminishing of inequality and so forth. So I think I think this is something that we must understand because sometimes I think that uh, in the in the internal narratives in Venezuela, especially the narrative promoted by uh, some sectors of the opposition, even some sectors on the left that have not been uh, have not understood well these dynamics, they they have pressured you know they 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 pressure the government uh, as if it's something that that the government is not doing while not recognizing that it's actually the government is actually being cut off. The state of Venezuela is being cut off. Uh, the state of Venezuela is actually being robbed. I mean, we have we we have been robbed of Sidgo, for example. We have been robbed of the money that is in the Venezuelan uh, foreign accounts. We have been robbed of the gold that is in England. We have you know we're constantly being robbed of uh, assets that belong to the Venezuelan people and belong to the Venezuelan state, uh, or or that should be used by the Venezuelan state to provide for the Venezuelan people. So this is the perversity of, of this uh, methodology of uh, sanctions. And, and I must say, for the first time this year, I mean, I'm, I'm just coming uh, back from uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a session at the United Nations General Assembly when we were finally, uh, in, in you know, for the first time in 20 years, the General Assembly once again addressed the issue of unilateral coercive measures. And we had over 30 countries speak, and, and not only countries, but individual countries in their own capacity, but countries speaking on behalf of other groups of countries. And it was almost unanimous. Well, actually, you could say it was unanimous. It was a unanimous position to criticize and to reject 
these unilateral you know, coercive measures because at the end of the day, these uh these measures uh I mean the, the ones that didn't reject them are the ones that implement them, the United States, the European Union, Canada, and so forth, but not the countries that have been affected. That is about 30% of the world is affected by these measures and you know and, and got together at the United Nations to reject them and to try to uh you know uh, speak uh um, I, I would speak out and denounce this. Um, I think it's important that we say this also. Um, and when we when we when we look at issues such as uh, migration, um, that has affected Venezuela also in recent years, and you, we we have to stress, especially for the for our North American uh, audience, we have to stress that and you know, migration has been the result precisely of these course of measures precisely of the impact, the negative impact that this has had on people and that has forced people into economic migration. It's not political persecution, but it has been it but but it has been politically motivated. And because it was politically motivated and because it was in uh, the, it was there were incentives throughout the Latin American region but also in the United States to make people, you know, uh, uh to show that people were fleeing Venezuela. I mean this is Part of the of the negative uh, um, image that they wanted to create on Venezuela, then they you know they supported this rhetoric that oh people are being persecuted and they facilitated the you know the uh, for people to to come into uh, the United States or other places under the uh, allegations that they were being persecuted. But it was when it was really about uh, economic migration. If it had not been about economic migration, we wouldn't have the we wouldn't be having the rates. Of people actually coming back to Venezuela, you know, this is remarkable. I mean, in the last two or three years, we've received over five hundred thousand people to, that have come back to Venezuela. That the government now has a program that we just inaugurated about two weeks ago, uh, um, or actually, our the, the vice minister that, that was uh, appointed two weeks ago for a program that was already running, where we're now receiving Venezuelans back, and we're helping them. And, and we're also designing a program that to help Venezuelans where they wish to stay, because we understand obviously that migration is a human right. We're not criminalizing migration, but on the other hand, we're trying to protect people from being criminalized as minors. But none of this would be taking place if they hadn't been for those measures, for those sanctions. And I say this because as we go to elections on the 28th of July, the group of people that are responsible for calling for sanctions on their own country, for calling for an invasion on their own country, for uh, for calling for violence in the streets, all these issues that made people want to leave the country are the ones that are pretending now to say, you know, that oh, if they are elected over President Maduro, they, you know, then Venezuelans can come back. You know, the truth is that you know uh, they have been they their policies have been anti-Venezuelan, anti-working class since the beginning and we we have to be very uh, uh very we have, we have to understand this very well it's actually it's actually been the bolivarian revolution that has provided for people to come back to venezuela that has provided to you know uh, new formulas to try to stabilize the economy in the middle of of, of these attacks i mean what what joseph was uh, was describing uh, you know it, it's very difficult to imagine where we're not living it like we have been in the last you know five or six years but it's true that you know there were there were points that were you know we faced very difficult situations you know lack of access to to everyday you know uh, items that were necessary for both for both in food both in in, in, in you know in healthcare and other things and you know we've been progressively overcoming those difficulties and that's that is, and that has been because of you know a steady decision of the government not to surrender, to try out whatever it needed to try out in order to guarantee that we would get, you know, uh, things going. And and that meant a lot of trial and error because, you know, there was no, we didn't know how to deal with sanctions. We didn't know how to deal with the situation before. But, you know, we eventually, uh, I think, uh, ha have found now a way to, uh, you know, manage uh, and, and, to, and, and to be now uh, living a sort of recovery um, that, you know, for example, uh, a country with an oil economy like Venezuela that used to import, you know, about uh, 80% of its of its food now is, you know, is because of the sanctions and, and because of the, 
not because of the sanctions, because of the resilience of the Venezuelan people in the face of the sanctions. Now it's being able to produce over 90% of what it consumes internally uh, in, in food. And that is, that is amazing. That is, and so, so I, I saw one in the chat, you know, I don't think we have to thank the sanctions. I think we have to thank people's willingness to, you know, to organize, to face uh, challenges. And also we have to recognize a government that didn't give up because the easiest thing would have been to privatize everything, to turn it liberal, to just give in. And there, and there has been always a commitment on, uh, from, from this government to maintain the path to socialism, to maintain the you know, social guarantees that we, were, you know, that we were trying to achieve under, under uh, the revolution. And and that was that is what I believe, and what, 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 why I'm convinced that we're going to uh, win an election again on uh, July 28th. You know, a lot of people, specific uh, people, have suffered um, because of the sanctions. You know, we every everything has you know the the, the impact that the sanctions have had, for example, in damaging our 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 public works uh, system. You know, damaging uh, the electrical system because we can't have maintenance or we can get uh, spare parts. Even garbage trucks. I mean, we couldn't get spare parts for garbage trucks. You know, to pick up, uh, uh, you know, to pick up garbage. Imagine what that creates in a country. I mean, just just the fact that you know garbage pickup is 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 not normal. Of course, then then you know they do that so that people will blame the government. As people say, oh, this is laziness. This is corruption. This is whatever. But it's really, you know, that you know, uh, creating conditions of chaos, of of despair on the population. Uh, you know, we uh, we used to have before uh, the the blockade. We used to have this very strong, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we used to be able to provide a lot, a lot of uh, uh, medicines for uh, for patients with specific. Illnesses that then became really hard to you know to be able to purchase and, and to bring into into the country. I mean, we used to have also uh, you know I, I think even uh, LGBT uh, community uh, has uh, complained, for example, especially our trans community. How, how for example, they uh, before they used to get uh, um, hormone treatments and all these things in order to for for their process to take place, and how that was also blocked. Uh, during the maximum pressure campaign, and they weren't able uh, to get a hold of it. So you see how you, there's there's a way to affect the whole population, and then you know together with the narrative, always a negative narrative by the mainstream media, by the, you know their their um, their uh, uh, social media, in order to always blame the government for for these conditions. But it, it, when it's really how the tentacles of you know the blockade is spread. And hit every aspect of uh, society, societal life. So I think this is, you know, uh, it's important that that we learn more, that, that you know, that we look more into what these processes have been and what the actual effects of the sanctions have been. Because you know, as Jerma just pointed out, you know, no matter how many you know other factors were there to to add in. The you know the damage the level of damage that has been done by by sanctions has been terrible and 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 has really impacted. I mean, you had a country that in twenty thirteen had a you know an income of about uh, you know uh, of about uh, um, eighty billion dollars go down to about seven hundred million dollars in twenty twenty one. That's a huge deficit. That's about losing more than ninety percent of your income, uh, and this is all due to uh, these sanctions, and this is all due uh, to the strategy of trying to make people turn against their own government and trying to make people turn against their own democracy. So, um, you know, uh, I think we are undergoing a new moment. Uh, I think Venezuela, the last uh, couple of of years have been years of optimism, and I think we're going to face a new moment now, uh, where we're going to definitely. Um, uh, we we have learned to deal with these sanctions. We know they're not going to go away. I mean, I, I don't. I don't think. Uh, I don't hope uh, that the U.S. policy is going to miraculously completely turn uh, and lift all sanctions because, really, um, you know the. 
the the the, the strategy both of Trump and of the Biden administration has been to keep them in place. So I think it's be very difficult to to think that we you know from one day to the other we're going to have them all gone. And we have the example of Cuba, how it's been uh, you know harassed for you know decades. So I think that is it is now learning to move with these measures, learning to be creative, and learning to find new ways, which is really where you know our future uh, lies. So happy to um, be able to participate, and of course take any questions that that you have. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, yeah, for for adding that important perspective to Yosmer. Um, a lot of folks, as you saw earlier in the chat, were definitely interested in today how sanctions impact the elections in different communities in Venezuela. So it's important to have uh, that insight. I know especially some folks are here today that have been working with Venezuelan migrants living in the United States. And that's an important community to organize with here in North America and to, uh, you know, get involved in our work against U.S. policy in Venezuela. And it's really great to have some some of you here today alongside the other activists and folks joining us from across North America. The um, time now uh, will make a few announcements, uh, give Yosmer and Carlos the time to look through the Q&A box. There's a few questions there. Uh, which are some great ones, and um, we'll come back to that Q&A. Uh, but the one of the most recent uh, things pointed in the chat leads me to an announcement uh, as I give William Kamakaro a heads up to get ready to speak. Uh, so the announcement I'll make is uh, for a webinar that the Venezuela Solidarity Network has also uh, co-sponsored a webinar series, actually, and it has to do with exactly the question, the elections upcoming in Venezuela. And that is a webinar series put on by uh, the Orinoco Tribune and the International Manifesto Group, uh, co-sponsored by a, a number of other organizations, which I will read out in a second, uh, but it's gonna be a webinar series taking place on Sunday, July 7th, and then Sunday, July 14th, uh, featuring speakers from around uh, North America as well, uh, London here on this poster with Francisco Dominguez. So a really important lineup of speakers an opportunity uh, to learn more specifically about the upcoming elections in Venezuela. I'll put the information in the chat for how to register. If you go to the Orinoco Tribune website, you can find the link really easily, uh, but it will also be here in the chat. I'll just share the second uh, poster as well, webinar number two. <laughs> So this is for the one that is taking place on the 14th. Again, another great lineup of Venezuelan and, and North American voices. And I uh, really want to encourage people to join in that webinar series, July 7th and 14th. So that is the uh, webinar series uh, co-organized by the International Manifesto Group and the Orinoco Tribune also uh, sponsored by the Alliance for Global Justice, the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, the Geopolitical Economy Report, the Louis Riel Bolivarian Circle in Toronto, Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, the Venezuela Solidarity Network, and Mint Press News. I'm going to put that in the chat and invite William Kamakaro to make a few remarks about an important action that took place in New York City just yesterday on June 24th. Uh, William, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Welcome. Just let me know when you want me to share the photo. Okay. Thank you very much, Alison. Also, thank you very much, Carlos and Josmar, for that uh, excellent ex exposition about what's going on in Venezuela. Um, basically, uh, also, I just very quickly want to mention that while Carlos was talking, I was reading the uh, Ultimas Noticias, a newspaper, Venezuelan newspaper, and President Maduro just said, announced that Venezuela is producing one million barrels of oil per day now. And I think that is a very good news <laughs> and also something important. Yes, yesterday we have a... Um, uh, protests in front of the United States mission at uh, the UN 
they uh, we went uh, this is the third time that we organize something like that again the united states mission and the united nation and the last test was with Ramsey clark and Ramsey clark was the man that delivered the message directly to the first secretary of the united nation of the united states mission at the un uh, he went inside to the lobby and delivered the message the letter with a big amount of signatures in support of Venezuela. So we're trying to do the same thing this time, but everything had changed. They basically don't allow us to go inside of the lobby. Uh, and they uh, they basically put the group to walk to different places to put the letter and the mails that they would receive. And, and at the end, an officer said to us, just send uh, mail, regular mail to whoever you want in the mission. So they didn't receive the letter. They didn't uh, talk to us like in the few, in the past. So, but it's very important to do that because we were in front of the United States mission at the UN and we were able to see that they were not very happy with us. And with all the announcement that we have and the yelling that we have in front of the building. From there, we decided to go to the Venezuelan mission that is just one block from, from the UN, from the USA mission. And we have encountered with uh, Joaquin Perez, who is the deputy ambassador of Venezuela. Um, and he received the delegation. We went to the lobby. He spoke to us for a little while, and we can share some pictures that we have with him in the lobby. It uh, was a very nice conversation with him. The group was very exciting. Uh, some of the people basically tried to get selfies with him. So, but yeah, was, that was very good encounter. And and I feel like um, we were very successful to get more than, I think more than 1,200 signatures uh, from all over. We have uh, people like uh, Roger Waters, Signing also uh, people like um um uh, Alfred Esaya, uh, uh, Atilio Boron, some big guys that really like to support Venezuela and and support the the letter. So we were requesting uh because we were very worried. We are extremely worried about the fact that in the last eight months. More than six assassination attempts have been happening against President Maduro. So that's one of the issues that we mentioned in the letter. But also our extreme, extreme um, awareness about the electoral process in Venezuela that's taking place this coming July 28. And we basically said that um, uh, we are very worried, but we know that the, this coming July 28, Venezuelan people, the will of the Venezuelan people and um, the peace will win. So we will not see any disturbing, again, the Venezuelan, despite all the, uh, the effort coming from the United States to destroy this uh, event that will take place this coming July 28. I just want to invite everybody in the audience to be alert with this coming electoral process that's taking place in Venezuela, it's extremely important that we denounce whatever the United States wants to implement again the Bolivarian Revolution in the next coming days. It's very important to denounce those elements from the opposition that are living in the United States and that openly are attacking Venezuela and the Venezuelan people. And, and it's very important also to go to Venezuela, to show solidarity, to be connected, you go to Venezuela with media, with people here, to basically inform and report back whatever happened in the country. I just want to say that and basically uh, say again, again, thanks to uh, to Carlos and Josmar, and thank you, Alison. Thank you, William. To give people an idea of what it looked like, this is when the delegation visited, uh, of course, not the U.S. mission, as William no, explained, not. we're not let in, but this is the Venezuelan mission, of course. <laughs> the photos of Maduro, Chavez, and Bolivar. 
uh, where they were warmly greeted uh, regarding the important petition delivery yesterday. Thank you, William, for organizing the action and leading the organi organizing of it. This is one of the many events of the Venezuela Solidarity Network. And again, I encourage people to join and follow the Venezuela Solidarity Network. I'm going to put in the chat uh, the social media links where you can join us uh, and find the ways to get involved. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, now that we've given our, our speakers the chance to review some of the questions, uh, we can go ahead and get started with a with a question and answer period. Uh, one common thread I'm seeing uh, through the questions, uh, Yosmer, if you are uh, available to speak, uh, is regarding especially Venezuela's uh, participation in international economic agreements. So uh, has kind of what has been the impact and is there what is happening today uh, with agreements like ALBA or CELAC? Are these uh, helping the relief of the uh, US uh, unilateral coercive measures against Venezuela? Um, Carlos has answered a bit about BRICS, but if you have any insight you'd like to share about BRICS as well, that would be much appreciated. Yes, thank you. Of course. We have to have a way to allude to the unilateral coercive measures. And one of the mechanisms being constructed to respond to it is the BRICS. But ALBA also, right now, and in fact, I am providing... Um, uh, 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 providing aid to the secretary of the ALBA. And uh, we know sometimes we have to do these things silently because there are spies everywhere. But Venezuela has to be part of this transformation of the new multipolar world. And even beyond our dreams for multipolarity, it is a need now because the, without this, the United States is going to be able to block off more and more of the world. And so we can't, uh, they do this through the dollar and the UCMs are going to prevent the progress of non-hegemonic financial blocks that could result in saving the planet. Thank you. All right. Carlos, if there's a question you want to answer, I, I know you're uh, in the middle of arriving in Honduras, so feel free to turn on your camera when you're available, but I can see you're typing in the chat, which is excellent. Oh, oh you are there. Okay. Is there is there anything you'd like to add regarding the international economic agreement? Oh, I, th I think uh, it, it's important that, you know, Venezuela, um, you know, despite what the the U.S. and the sanctions wanted to do, which was isolate Venezuela, it's been the other way around. I mean, Venezuela is act very actively participating, has has been participating in, in you know, different sorts of um, um, integration uh, arrangements, not only in the region, but those that have, um, those that have, um, uh, you know, that, that are even farther away. BRICS was an example. I mean, we're waiting to enter uh, bricks and we and you know from the last ministerial uh, meeting there were a lot of projects that came out of how Venezuela can you know can help. We, I mean having you know important energy and and other uh, resources, uh, we can help those economies uh, grow, complement those economies. But also of course you know Venezuela has been an a founding member of OPEC uh, since uh, many years ago. Uh, Venezuela is active and and you know you mentioned Alba and. Uh, and you know, Alba is trying to redefine also its path uh, in order to um, also fight against those uh, coercive measures because a lot of the Alba members like Cuba and Nicaragua, as well as Venezuela, are also under under sanctions. So it's important that we address that. But the the key thing is that you know they have not been able to isolate us. As, as a matter of fact, you know, this, despite all the difficulties. Uh, our relations uh, with different countries continue to grow and, and continue to be 
very lively, and I think that has been key. I mean, it has been our, our protection. When we when we were at the worst moment of the pandemic and we weren't able to import, or we, we weren't able to buy vaccines because our money was frozen in foreign bank. When we were able to import medicine because uh, precisely, uh, you know, the, the sanctions scared off a lot of the people from selling uh, things to Venezuela. Well, it was the solidarity of other countries, of those other relations that Venezuela had with China, with Cuba, with India, with Russia, with Turkey, that allowed us to really, uh, you know, survive and move forward. So I think that has been very important. Thank you. So there's one question in the chat that's probably difficult to answer, but it says, what is the most important technical measure that the government of Venezuela took uh, since 2019 to bring about uh, this recovery? Yosmer, uh, did you want to try and tackle that one? Sí. Sí. Ya me escuchan. Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Yes. It's really about five measures that are part of the virtuous formula, the technical measures, which is what I believe you're asking. The first was to dismantle the existing exchange system in Venezuela, oil revenue coming into the government and to the, um, the treasury, all of the foreign exchange. Then there was a and uh, a control system for this uh, uh, hard currency when we had uh, when the oil economy collapsed, they said there's nothing to control. And they said, no, we have to keep the dollar stable. We couldn't keep it stable because we could not uh, handle the demand of uh, foreign exchange that was coming from outside and the struggle over this. Well, we dismantled the exchange system and created a new exchange system in which the private um, uh, suppliers and uh, buyers set the prices. Since we did not manage for an exchange and we just have very little bit for basic services like vaccines and medicines we allowed it that to play out as it was and many people had their own savings in dollars and they had a disaccumulation of assets in dollars and that was the first thing that we had to dismantle it the second one was to restrict liquidity at the banks how did we do that we did this through something called legal um, reserve. And we took all of the money out of the banks because we discovered that some banks, not all of them, were giving cheap credit for people to pressure, put pressure on the demand for uh, the exchange rate or for dollars. That they, they borrowed in bolivars and then they tried to sell in dollars. But we said enough of that we had very strict legal um, reserve requirements imposed on the banks so that they would not have that demand or that pressure on the dollar. And so the dollar market began to stabilize. The other thing that we did was that credit in the, the interest rate for credit was lagging. It was not synchronized with inflation. If the interest rate was very low and inflation was very high, so we synchronized them. We took measure, and certainly at the central bank, but of course it was approved by the national executive and in coordination with them, as we always do, so that people requesting a loan... Uh, um, after three months, they would get the money. They couldn't just get the money and buy dollars and then sell it uh, at a fraction of the rate. We eliminated that because now if I uh, loan you $100, then over time, you have to pay it in three, four, six months, but you have to pay back the $100. Another very important measure that's not here, and I'll close out with this, is that the central bank began to pub publish inflation rates regularly. In other words, because of problems that existed with all of these attacks we were uh, undergoing, we began to publish, and this 
around 2019, 2020, this had a big impact on price setting because the central bank was establishing the path of prices in the economy. So this also was good for economic expectations for economic agents, and it injected a little bit of trust in the economy, which also allowed inflation to calm down. The other major measure, it's not so much a measure, but when we no longer were a rentier economy with all this oil revenue, they had the people you had to set the price of a pencil here. Previously, people had a lot of money would pay more for it, but if it's overpriced, uh, uh, speculation prices like 30 months. And since I had so much money because of all the oil revenue I was getting and I would pay 30% more. No, since the, the money is scarce and it comes out of my bucket, this pencil is only going to be sold at the price that it's worth. We previously, we, we looked at prices of goods and services. Now, uh, people who offers or produce a pencil previously knew that somebody else would be able, willing to pay 30% more. Now, since they no longer do this, they have to sell it at regular low prices. And also their profits of the business owners were exorbitant. And the consumer also uh, has more income and they could afford to buy pencils when they weren't at speculation prices. So all of this is due to a much more logical price setting, and that also calmed down inflation in Venezuela. Those are the impo most important measures. Thank you. I had a feeling it would be hard to come up with one only, but that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so before we move into the group photo kind of closing of tonight's webinar and online picket with the Venezuela Solidarity Network, uh, I wanted to uh, once again thank our speakers, Carlos and Aaron and Yosmer Aretian. Um, if you could, as I finish my remarks, uh, think of a few words you might want to say in regards to the importance of solidarity from people in North America, what people in North America can do to fight these unilateral coercive measures imposed against Venezuela. That would be excellent. Um, Following their closing remarks, we'll move into a, a group photo and I'll explain how that's going to go. Uh, but I do want to be uh, both uh, cautious of your time and of the time of all of our organizers and interpreters, especially tonight. Uh, so we will uh, not be able to get to all of the questions, uh, but your questions have given us very good ideas for upcoming webinars and online pickets, the kind of topics that are going to be important to discuss. Uh, so thank you very much for, for the, submitting the questions. Um, so closing remarks, uh, Yosmer, would you like to go first? Anything you'd like to say in regards to what people in North America can do uh, to fight these criminal measures? Wow. Change government. Well, I think the first thing I want to say is I want to thank the Alliance for Global Justice, uh, Carlos, for your invitation. Well, what can you do? Well, this sort of thing helps. Maybe a series. Uh, I'd be willing to be a part of this. We can present the book through this uh, system, and we can show other proof. And, and talk a little bit more about this virtuous formula, because it's not easy to talk about everything that Venezuela has done, but it should be, uh, people, the world should know. This is a way of breaking the unilateral coercion of measures. And I thank you, because it's not just me, I think it's the second or third time that I, that I talk internationally about what we're doing. Um, because they, they think that us Venezuelans are, we're looking at uh, people that are constructing the economy in Venezuela are not academic. We don't think we don't, we don't have all that is needed to actually uh, construct an economy. Therefore, we're people that we don't have vocabulary. We don't have experience because we're, we're just bad and people 
people sub underestimate us. And that's good because we're constructing something that is good for the world. It doesn't matter if they underestimate us. And uh, today I feel very good as, as someone that has been living this analysis. This, this analysis makes me cry sometimes. It makes me very angry. But in, in the end, having you there, listening to us and, and a lot of people uh, support us in the world. Because listen, Bolivar was born here. Chao is, was born here. We have oil reserves. We have a wonderful people. And, and it's, I'm a part of this, this people that suffered this. And I'm, I feel I have company in you. And so really, I just want to thank you. I'm very thankful and I'm here to help in any way to talk about what we've done. I, I studied economy and, and I am completely available for any uh, webinar you may want to do. Thank you so much for that generous offer. I, I see that many of us are looking forward, of course, to your book. Um, when it's available, probably in Spanish first. So we'll have to work on that. But uh, many of us will will make every effort to read it and use it as a helpful resource for sure. Uh, Carlos, go ahead. I agree with Jocelyn. I, I think that this this work that you guys do of, of you know uh, consistently bringing out these uh, spaces for for these discussions are key. I mean, it's it's only going to be once people, in, especially in the U.S., where it's, you know where all this uh, aggression starts, you know, uh, once people in the U.S. really know and, and understand uh, what's going on, and 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 then they and and you know it gets to become you know uh, uh, a tough issue for those making the decisions. Well, I think you know it's it's really important that. Uh, that you know uh, that it's the only way things are really going to change because that because that the the, the you know the, the change of policy is what is needed to you know to, to have a different type of relationship with the u.s so everything that is done by the solidarity every you know the denunciation of these aggressions every rally like the one william and and, and all the other comrades did uh in support in 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 our mission at the u.n those are hugely important things because also it motivates us uh, to know that like Josmer said that we're not alone that that you understand our 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 plight and that you know we're all together in this because we understand that it's also very difficult for you for you living in in, in those countries with an imperialistic attitude uh it's also difficult for you to to be there uh trying to change things so this is this is our common struggle and uh, we will all be here together in solidarity with each other to make, you know, um, until we all achieve the victory of living in peace and justice together. Thank you very much, Carlos Ron. What, uh, yeah, incredible webinar, a wealth of knowledge to, to learn from and to use in our further work. Uh, today has been... Um, a webinar that I know many of us will go back to again in order to uh, make sure we have all the information and, and as we've said, arm ourselves for our future work. Uh, thank you again to everyone that has been helping to build and organize the Venezuela Solidarity Network, which is now taking on these monthly webinars and online pickets, uh, to the Alliance for Global Justice for hosting today and all the efforts and work that went into that. Uh, we've had a very smooth webinar so far and are now moving into the section of the webinar um, where uh, folks uh, will be invited to join us in the panelist space if you'd like to uh, turn on your camera. You will get an invitation uh, say, asking if you'd like to be a panelist and if you uh, wouldn't mind um, and you'd like to turn on your camera and join the group photo. I think this will work. Um, the setup is a little different than the last few months. So I think it's gonna work out here. Uh, if you can't turn on your camera yet, we might just have to change a setting that allows folks to do so. Um, I haven't sent all the invitations yet, but as I continue to do so, I will say as well, 
uh, that you uh, are all invited to join the next of the online uh, pickets and monthly webinars of the Venezuela Solidarity Network. Uh, that uh, will be on Tuesday, July 23rd, um, and will be uh, hosted this time by the Sanctions Kill campaign, which I encourage also folks to, to get involved with and to find out more about. If you would like to join the photo and you have not received an invitation, please uh, raise your hand and I will try and get one to you as soon as possible. That's the way I like it. So you, again, you will get a, a part uh, notification will pop up on your screen that will say, would you like to rejoin the webinar as a panelist? You do have to agree in order to be able to be part of the group photo. And if we go ahead and also, I'll change my view, but I don't think that will change everyone's view. We can change ourselves to a uh, gallery view, then we can start to see each other. There's just a few kinks to work out here. Um, I, but I think folks, your camera will not automatically go on, but I do believe you will be able to turn it on. Just a few hands. Basically, the idea is that we would like to have all been with William Kamakaro and his co-fighters in New York yesterday uh, delivering those letters. We'd like to be at a protest united in front of the White House, uh, you know, in solidarity with Venezuela, but that's not always possible. So can we create this online space where we can see each other each month, we can learn from one another, and uh, part of that is this group photo. Oh, here we are. So I've seen all your your great faces, your struggling faces joining. Um, again, if you haven't gotten an invitation to turn on your, to join us in the panelist space, please raise your hand and I will send it. Some some folks who've been part of the monthly pickets for the last three years are used to the, the drill. Others, this is new. Thanks to the Alliance for Global Justice tech team for dealing with this uh, and helping, <laughs> helping, uh, get this looking good, but everyone's looking great. We'll give it one more minute. I know there's still some folks raising their hands here. Again, welcome. We have been joined here from people I've seen in the chat across uh, North America, really covering all parts of, of Canada, Quebec, uh, the United States. Thank you all. Okay. Anyone has not received the invitation but would like to join your our group photo, please do raise your hand. Okay. I'm seeing everyone slowly join. Takes a bit of time. But um, we'll also be able to chant together again, like we are in front of the White House, like uh, we are uh, gathered together. I won't, of course, hesitate to give a second Third, fourth, fifth, big thank you to our interpreters. Very important to us that these webinars are bilingual, but it is a difficult, difficult job to do simultaneous interpretation, uh, especially on the con economy. <laughs> so I will say thank you again to all the interpreters. I think everyone that wanted to join our photo is now here. You should be able to turn on your cameras. Let's say it loud and clear. Hands off Venezuela. Hands off Venezuela. Hands off Venezuela. Hands off Venezuela. Venceremos. 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 Thank you again, everyone. Hands off Venezuela. Yeah, there we go. Get involved in the Venezuela Solidarity Network. The information is in the chat. You'll be able to share and send this Gracias. video around. Un abrazo fuerte, a big, big hug. Mm -hmm to Josmer Arellan and to Carlos Rome. Can I make a quick statement? Gracias. Gracias, gracias. 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 We look forward to our continued struggle together. Venceremos, we will win. Can I make we a quick statement? Venceremos. Maybe. Can I make a quick statement, please? I know, no, I hate to brag, but uh, I know if I be, I'm running, gonna run for office one day, 
and when I do, I'm gonna help. I'm gonna help the people of Venezuela. It's one of my one of my duties. Cause you're right. We should. We should be. Bueno. We should be help. We should be. We are for the. We should respect the will of the people, not not to for, enforce it. Victory to the will of the people. We will win. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Gracias. Buenas noches. Gracias. Buenas noches. Nos vemos. Good evening.